Revenue operations is much more than words in a job title. It's a methodology that is transforming sales, marketing, and customer success teams into high-performing revenue drivers. However, many revenue leaders still have critical questions about how to operationalize it. Furthermore, they want to know what others in the industry are doing. That's why we conducted original research and put together our findings in the 2021 Revenue Operations and Customer Acquisition Benchmark Report. In partnership with RevOps Squared, we asked hundreds of cross-departmental revenue leaders across top companies to reveal their approach to revenue planning, analytics and revenue operations, and customer acquisition. We've identified exactly how teams are aligning to hit their revenue targets, as well as the new activity, pipeline, and customer acquisition benchmarks to strive for in 2021 and beyond. Download the entire report for free at ringdna.com slash revopsreport. What if your sales team could know the moment a buyer arrives on your website and talk with them instantly? With Qualified's conversational sales and marketing platform purpose-built for Salesforce, that's all possible. It's not rocket science, it's common sense. Conversations move deals forward. Live chat, voice calls, and meeting bookers accelerate sales conversations without a single email exchange. Capture prospects in that magic moment when they're most interested in learning about your business. Head on over to qualified.com to chat with their team and learn more. been leaning into this notion of revenue moments. And it is this notion that any engagement with a prospective customer is actually quite important. From our standpoint, it really is about driving those meaningful, value-added conversations that are helping a prospective customer better understand the challenge and opportunities that they're facing and the ways in which those can be solved. But doing so in a crisp, manner that also facilitates decision-making within the organization. Hi, friends. Welcome to the Sales Enablement Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Paul. That was Michael Lundgren. Michael's the CMO at Seismic. And today we're going to discuss the findings from the 2021 edition of Seismic's annual benchmark report on sales enablement titled Decoding the Best Practices of Visionaries. We start off with Michael sharing how Seismic defines a sales enablement visionary, and then we dive into some specifics. How sales enablement visionaries are the organizations and individuals within those organizations that think of sales enablement as a business enabler. And more importantly, how sales enablement is championed by the most senior leadership within those organizations. Then Michael and I dig into the five key findings from the report for sales enablement leaders, how to position sales enablement as a strategic priority, how to drive go-to-market alignment, how to avoid tech silos, how to encourage the adoption of sales enablement platform capabilities, and how to use insights to scale best practices across the organization. We also get to what visionary organizations do differently in each of these categories to drive better results across all customer-facing roles. So we're going to dig into all this and much, much more. But before we get to Michael, I want to remind you to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. And if you subscribe, we'd really appreciate it if you could also give us your feedback about how we're doing in the form of a review. So thank you. All right, let's jump into it. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andy. It's great to be here. So you're joining us from where today? San Mateo. San Mateo, California. Yes. Oh, yeah, there's what's what's that famous breakfast place that's in this neighborhood? Um, really wooded neighborhood, old place. Somebody always used to take me there. Friends. In San Mateo? I, I don't. How long ago right. was it? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll have to look it up. I'll get it to you. It's, I'm sure yeah. it's still there. I was. That's probably no. Who knows? post-pandemic, but it's some famous place in San Mateo. Everybody meets for breakfast. And it's like this residential neighborhood, but not, this thing sits on a corner and it's been there forever. Um, okay, now that I've thrilled the audience with that <laughs> description. <Sorry. laughs> 
So we're going to talk about Seismic's uh, annual sales enablement benchmark report for 2021. This one, decoding the best practices of visionary. So I like to start this discussion with a definition of term. So not to put you on the spot, but what's, what's your definition of sales enablement? So my definition of sales enablement is really providing uh, go-to-market teams with the tools that they need, uh, particularly around content, to be able to engage with prospective customers um, in a very effective manner and Mm -hmm. to resonate with them and be able to provide uh, or drive a conversation that's around the, the, the challenges that they face and discuss solutions for those challenges. Right. So you... Naturally, because of seismic, you're oriented a little bit around content, but it's yeah. it's more than content, right? It is more con- more than content. Um, you know, sales enablement can also include sales readiness, sales coaching, um, social selling, um, a variety of different components. It, but it, it truly is enabling sellers to be able to engage more effectively with customers. And in this year survey and in your report, are you? focus primarily on the content part in terms of the results, you know, the, the re- numbers that you report on that we'll get into a little bit later, or is it the whole spectrum? You know, it really is the whole spectrum. And so we look at um, uh, really the um, what constitutes the, the key drivers for business outcomes and business success mm-hmm. uh, as it relates to sales enablement, um, you know, for companies. And so and it, it covers a variety of different things. It, it covers um, overall prioritization of sales enablement, inc- includes uh, mm-hmm. use of sales tools. It's a, it's a broad set of considerations. Okay. All right. So we're, we'll dive into that. So one of the things that, that the report source has up front is, and this, I always love diving into this because I'm a bit of a contrarian on this, is it says the B2B buyer preferences and behaviors have fundamentally changed. Now, are we talking pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, or just this is sort of the natural evolution of things? I think there's a little bit of both, actually, Andy. I think part of it is, uh, in general, um, we're seeing B2B buyers, you know, we're all consumers first, and so we're uh-huh. all influenced by our consumer experiences. And so individuals are used to being able to go to sites like Amazon.com, do a search on products sort by you know, customer rated products and then do deep dive um, uh, research in the moment to de- make a determination regarding what solution is gonna be best for them. And so increasingly we see B2B buyers carrying their B2C experience expectations into the B2B realm. And increasingly buyers are interested in doing self-serve uh, discovery um, and uh, as part of the, uh, the purchase process or the overall buying process. Um, there are other things that are taking place too, but that's, that, was, that's, that change is independent of the pandemic. Now with, with the pandemic itself, obviously that's really changed things. And in our view, it's, it's actually accelerated um, a number of things, but- um, Well, what have, you, what have you seen that's accelerated? What we're seeing accelerating is that uh, organizations have needed to equip their go-to-market teams to be able to engage uh, with the latest messaging positioning very quickly and to, and to push out new messaging positioning basically on the fly because the business environment changed so quickly. Um, the way in which um, organizations you know, were choosing to prioritize their offerings, to message their offerings, um, and uh, enable their sales team just fundamentally changed. And so um, it was important for organizations to be able to quickly adapt to changing needs of customers on a variety of different fronts, and then also to enable their sellers to engage in a really compelling manner in a fully digital environment. Part of what I sort of push back about is I think that, that people overestimate just how much face-to-face was taking place in B2B sales. And certainly, you know, take the SaaS space as an example. I mean, I remember speaking at this, this enterprise sales forum in New York and, I don't know, it was 50, 60 uh, enterprise sales leaders and enterprise sellers there and, and all SaaS. And, yeah, I remember asking, you know, who, who travels to close the deal? And virtually none of them. 
you know, I started doing price ranges. You know, finally once I got above two hundred thousand, somebody raised their hand, and I was like, okay, now we have all this <laughs> points of view being put out there. It's like, ah, things have changed so radically. It's like, you know, it's like purely digital. I'm like, well, yeah, sure. We went almost exclusively digital, but I'd be willing to bet. Yeah, you know, I saw one report that said that estimated only twenty five percent of sales touches prior to the pandemic were were virtual or digital. I'm like, no, that's not the case. I mean, it's like, I just want to try to establish, you know, what sort of this basis here that we're changing from. And I think that we changed at the margins, but we changed, to your point, we changed almost 100%. But I guess the follow-up question is, is, is how do you see that evolving the experience of seismic, let's say, as we start moving out of the pandemic, do customers do customers never want to meet with salespeople again, or <laughs> face in, in person, or what do you see is happening? So there are a few things. I think you know another thing that we're able to look at is the actual data regarding the utilization of seismic itself, and so sure. um, the extent to which um, sellers and go-to-market teams in general are, are searching on content. Uh, creating content, distributing content, and the the growth trajectory that we're on uh, accelerated dramatically um, mm-hmm. with the onset and um, continuation of the pandemic. And so we're able to look at that. We're able to, you know, we had customers that, that called us um, pretty extensively asking for guidance on how to adapt. And so um, back to the, the notion of, um, you know, kind of some of the changes that are taking place too. I, one of the um, stats that I've really been struck by is a recent stat that came out from McKinsey that indicates that 75% of, uh, you know, customers today would prefer at least initially to really engage deeply through self-directed means um, or virtually uh, via sellers. And that's, you know, that's a stat that seems to be growing over time. And the dollar value of those deals seems to be going up pretty significantly significantly as well in, in that you now a decent percentage are willing to do a million dollar plus deals mm-hmm. uh, with no direct personal interaction. And so that, I believe, exceeds 15% now. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing that dynamic take place. I think the, the practical reality is um, people in general become a lot more comfortable interacting virtually and... Um, uh, in engaging in, in deep conversations, including, um, you know, uh, making decisions, negotiating the deals, et cetera. Mm-hmm. They've had to. And it's also a lot more efficient. Um, if you can take travel out of the equation, obviously you can uh, have a lot more meetings and um, engage with a lot more uh, or much higher volume of, of prospects. And so moving forward, you know, my expectation is that there's going to be more of a hybrid model that will be more virtually oriented, certainly much more than it has been in the past. Um, but there will still be in-person uh, contact. It will take place in a variety of different form formats, including, you know, customer events, for example, where individuals want to be able to go and actually meet in person uh, other, you know, customers of a given solution. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a fascinating question to think about, right? Because yeah. you know, I, where I come from is like, okay, well, you know, I think virtual is used almost exclusively to really to refer to video. And, you know, for me, virtual includes the phone. And so virtual selling, as people on the show are probably tired of hearing me saying, started yeah. when the telephone was invented. Right, so <laughs> yeah, we we've been doing virtual selling, and I would make the case that in in except for purely you know field sales, detail men, visiting stores and locations, pharma sales reps, and so on, is that in sort of the classic B two B system sale and so on that it's been heavily and primarily virtual for quite some time. Um, and I talk my own experience in selling, you know, very expensive satellite communication systems to major enterprises across the world. You know, I might see them two or three times on a $10 million deal, maybe once in one time. And that was, yeah, quite a long while ago. But the point being is 
yeah, everything was about on the phone and, and fax and emails and so on. And it's like, yeah, we've been doing this for a long time. It's it's like, yeah, we, now we've added this level of uh, video that we do more uh, more regularly. But I, yeah, I, I always just as I push back. People think these sales behaviors are so new that we need to learn. It's like, yeah, really not. Right. Um, you know, I think there's I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, you know, what's new is old, and what's old is new. And there's you know, so there's a little bit of that um, going back and forth. I think the I think what we are seeing though are deals that in the past that almost absolutely required mm-hmm. at least one in person meeting. Right now are being done entirely virtually. Yep. Um, the other, you know, kind of component to this too is that the, the buying groups themselves seem to be getting larger. And so the number of people that need to be mm-hmm. interacted with is, um, is growing. And, um, and there's just a lot more um, depth that's involved in a in number of deals. The other thing that's, I think, worth pointing out, Andy, is there, there are differences across sure. industries. And so in financial services, um, you know, they are, it's quite common for, um, you know, uh, for financial um, advisors to meet in person um, with right. their clients. And in the world of the pandemic, that's gone completely away. And so how do those advisors meet really effectively, have really compelling content and engaging conversations when they can't do it in person? you know, over, over a meal or, you know, out on a golf course. And Were so, people still doing that? I mean, that's, I know in the financial services world, I, I remember speaking to someone who was director of enablement for a large financial services firm. Yeah. It would have been almost a year ago. I think it was May, May, June of last year. And yeah, they were quite honestly sort of struggling with this because they had sort of relied on, these, yeah, golf, dinner, and so on. But I wasn't, right. I think they'd always sort of struggled to say, was there a real return on that, right? I mean, was that really necessary? Or was that something that was sort of a, an extra, right? Yeah, bonus. We take the take the client out to play golf. Did it really cement the relationship? And it, there was, certainly there was a sense, my sense was that, and sort of talking to people on this show and other places, is that, yeah, that's across all industries. That, that had sort of also started going by the wayside. I, and that makes sense. I, and I think the, um, I think what we're seeing in this last year is just an acceleration, yeah. right? Where um, it, none of those interactions were happening. And so suddenly, you know, individuals that had been able to really rely upon those personal interactions aren't anymore. But I think the, the fundamental point around sellers increasingly need to be really informed around their customer mm-hmm. needs, um, potential solutions, and they need to be able to engage in a much more effective way in the past. And, and the reality is prospects and customers are increasingly pretty well informed uh, at the time that a seller actually does engage. And so um, it's becoming increasingly paramount that, that sellers are able to you know, have the really effective conversations um, in very competitive mm-hmm. markets and be able to, you know, put a consistent, compelling, you know, voice forward. And the other thing that I think we're finding is that it's not just about the seller themselves. It's now about, you know, it's the end to end overall buyer's journey. So starting off with the, you know, the, the business right. development rep that's having the initial conversation, how does that conversation carry through to engagement with the seller, carry through to the customer success, um, uh, team, you know, driving the deployment, carrying through to the renewal. You know, it's the company putting forth a consistent, um, aligned, on-brand, you know, story or value proposition um, throughout that entire journey. And it's, you know, customers are becoming increasingly um, uh, sensitive to what that mm-hmm. overall experience is. And it's a, you know, the companies are, that do that extremely well that, are, that end up performing the best. But you're still, though, I mean, yes, you're, you're transcending all those individual roles, but the fact is it's, it's still the, how they're experiencing those individuals that's sort of the, the sum total of that, which, again, gets back now to enablement is, <clears throat> you know, so often when I hear it talked about, it's, you know, people talk about the process, we talk about our tools, but 
it seems like they don't talk enough about what the impact is and what the benefit is to the individual seller or that individual contributor in whatever role, whether it's a BDR, SDR, or it's a, a seller or a customer success person. And sometimes you get the sense that, yeah, hey, we're talking about this thing sort of at this high level sales enablement, but it's like, okay, I'm an individual seller. Uh, yeah, well, really, what's in it for me? Well, so fundamentally, what's in it for me is uh, being able to uh, achieve, you know, achieve and exceed quota. And so, um, you know, that in you know, one of the things that we've started to really focus on is better quantification of the value um, uh, that an enabled solution can deliver. And so, and that's tied into you know win rates, uh, average time to close, average right. you know, deal size. And that can be quantified. And so, you know, organizations that are really looking at the overall value impact that, the, that an enabling solution can deliver, like that's increasingly becoming important and is becoming, um, you know, a set of metrics that, that organizations are, are starting to track. And so there's, there, from a value perspective, there's actually, there, there are kind of three key components that we tend to think about. One is around mm-hmm. ROI. One is around mm-hmm. overall customer experience, and the third is around brand compliance and just making sure that everything's on brand. So ROI of what? Of the enablement solution itself or ROI of on your sales effort or what part are you talking about? The way we tend to look at it our, ourselves is like is the, the ROI associated with the solution um, and the improved effectiveness and efficiency with which you know, go-to-market teams can operate. So. Right. How more effective are sellers? You know, again, at, at, at um, you know achieving their you know driving win rates. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's kind of the seller component. There's also the, the the marketing component in terms of you know how effective is the content. You know, what content's you know proving to be the most effective, and so continuing to invest in that type of content and then dialing back on other content, um, et cetera. And so I think. The way we tend to look at value is, is holistically mm-hmm. um, from a go-to-market team perspective. But that's, you know, enablement solutions across the spectrum do need to deliver true value to the company, and um, which really is major in terms of business outcomes. And so trying to actually tie in that value is, is something that we've been trying to go much deeper on. Right. And then for the, but again, back to your earlier, your earlier question, it, for the individual seller, it's like, is it helping them achieve quota? And not, so are they able to spend um, more time with customers, more time like actually engaging with prospects and less time searching? And is the, um, the manner in which they're engaging really compelling? Well, I think, yeah, the last part's the thing for me. I mean, I, I started to find enablement as saying, look, it's, you know, anything and everything that enables sellers to have knowledge-based sales interactions that the buyer acknowledges have value for them, right? And this is that last part so key, right, is, is yeah. which I think is really the goal, and you were sort of talking about it, is, is, yeah, can we make those moments where the seller's actually engaged with the buyer or any one of the stakeholders involved in the process, can we make those more effective, Right? Can, yes. can there actually be value delivered in a way that helps the buyer make progress toward making a decision? And I think that's still still the biggest challenge in my mind for sellers today is, yeah, how do we I like to say, yeah, there's actually an ROI for every sales call. Right? Did the buyer get a return on the time they invested in the company, in the seller, that hour, that two hours or whatever? And I think people aren't really mindful enough of the fact that they're being judged that way. It's an experiential score, right? Did we get, was this person worth my time? And so often I think deals go south or customer prospects go silent and the reps aren't really thinking, oh, they've already sort of decided we're not worth their time. You know, I think you're hitting up on a really important point around moments. And that's actually, that's a really, that's becoming a really important word for us. And we've, we've been, leaning into this notion of revenue moments, but, um, and it is this notion that any engagement with a, with a prospective customer is actually quite important. And so in your point regarding ensuring that a customer is actually getting value, that is incredibly important. And so 
from our standpoint, you know, I really like the way you defined um, sales enablement, but from our standpoint, it really is about driving those meaningful value added conversations that are helping a prospective customer better understand the challenge mm-hmm. and opportunities that they're facing and the ways in which those can be solved, but doing so in a crisp manner um, that also facilitates decision-making within the organization. Yeah. And that it's, I mean, to me, it's sort of the basic chasm or <laughs> gap that exists is that, you know, so much of what the way sellers are trained as part of their enablement is I think it's sort of overly focused on persuading a buyer to buy their solution as opposed to doing what you just said, which is helping them understand what the problem is, evaluate and get insights about what the alternative are, alter, alternatives are, excuse me, easy for me to say, uh, about how they can solve that and then choose what the best solution is. And then they choose their vendor, right? It's this, it's this whole first part about how we're really going to solve the problem is that I think we too often enable our sellers to say, look, yeah, your job is to persuade them to buy your product. <laughs> and it's, from an experiential standpoint, that doesn't sit well with buyers. Right. I mean, most people don't. I would posit that very few people like to be sold to. They do want to solve their problems. Mm-hmm. And so if you're able to engage in a really constructive way in understanding their problems, and then... Um, not only understand the problem as they see it, but also helping them deepen their own understanding of the problem yep. that they face and then how you can address that. That is a much better conversation. And so, um, and I think the, you know, I, I think what we're, what we're seeing is, you know, things like, you know, fundamentally there are ways of engaging with prospective customers that um, perform better in other ways, and so. So, what are you what are you finding that works better for you? Well, what I was going to make with say was a general comment that, um, you know, organizations can have a few different options in which in 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 the in the, the way they framed uh, their content and the right. case studies that they're sharing and so on. Uh, but a, in our view, AI is quickly becoming much more important in terms of helping to automatically serve up what is performing the best or likely to perform the best. Right. And so, um, right. so it's not, so the individual seller again, isn't left to their own devices to try to understand like, okay, what's going to be the most effective way to engage with this prospect. If, if they are served up content um, and, you know, in recommendations and playbooks that are, proving to be higher performing, the chances of a positive outcome for them go up. And, you know, likely the likely content is, is will, you know, facilitate a really good conversation uh, along with what we discussed. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, plug the home team here and ring DNA, our Yoda product we introduced is exactly what it does, you know, real time guidance for sellers in the midst of a conversation. Yeah. There's a so, lot of value there. Yeah. And well, that's, yeah, I think the thing for reps and sellers, they sort of hear this, and the, sometimes their you know, backs go up a little bit, and it's like, you're still in charge. You're still driving. Right. Right? And, and I think there are some companies that advertise pretty explicitly that, hey, our tool is there to substitute for the judgment of the seller. And, and I think that's a very dangerous approach to take because you know, no one can really – they're not in the moment, right? Even the best of our systems – they can make suggestions, but you as the seller still have to take the information that's provided, the context of what you're hearing from the buyer, the nuance, and synthesize everything and come up with the right thing or what you think is the right thing to, to suggest or to say or information provide. Um, but yeah, the tools are invaluable, at least being a way to help people say, okay, yeah, here are some other possibilities to think of that I might have might have forgotten about before. So I think as a seller, you want to welcome it, but still understand that you're not surrendering to it, which would I think would create a very stale buying experience for the buyer because they still want to talk to the person. 
Right. No, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think the, um, the guidance can be really helpful and might, you know, prompt, um, uh, things that some, uh, as a given seller may not have ever, you know, otherwise thought of. The other thing though, that I would say is that, um, if we're talking, I think it depends on where in the buyer journey someone is. And so if someone's at the top of the funnel and engaging with a relatively junior BDR that doesn't necessarily have, you know, really deep domain expertise, I think the guy. You don't have becomes, to say it that nicely. It's 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 you know, they're new. You wouldn't. I mean, there you go. They just they just don't know. And so being able to you know provide you know, like really good crisp guidance that's proven to work and have the analytics to back it up. Um, is um, is can be really helpful to driving growth in a business. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I'd agree. All right, so we haven't talked about your report at all, um, <laughs> which is always what happens when people come on the show. I, I, I spend hours preparing, and then we don't talk about anything that we talk prepared about. But I mean, let's, it is worth getting into because it's it. Yeah, no. You talk about the five key findings. You sort of alluded one before is the the requirement that. Senior management really make enablement a priority, and right. I mean, I think the numbers were it's, it was still sort of less than half the companies. I think that overall were were doing that, but certainly some companies doing it better than others. You had your visionaries and your laggards uh, right. in that regard. But what's holding back companies from understanding what the value of enablement is? I mean, is it just and I think partly because that's why I asked up front sort of the definition, because I think for, you know, I've had people on the show, we talk about enablement for them, it's basically training, right? Um, you know, it's not about content or it's not about coaching. You know, they sort of have these things still in their their separate uh, domains. Is that part of the problem is that, that you know, for senior management to get behind it is, is internally they haven't really provided a clear case for why they should do that? You know, that can be part of it, that there isn't um, a clear business case. I think most importantly, is there uh, at the CXO level um, a champion that sees the value of enablement? And so, um, you know, the more metrics driven, um, growth oriented, process improvement oriented, um, and informed of what's possible, you know, uh, the senior team is, um, the higher likelihood that, you know, there'll be real energy around making an investment in sales enablement. Um, you know, sales enablement itself is, you know, it's still an emerging discipline and, um, there, you know, there's an increasing percentage of senior leaders that actually, you know, can see the real value, but there, there are a number of components to effectively implementing, you know, sales enablement within an organization. It's, it is making it a strategic priority. It's, you know, having it report into, you know, an effective organization. It's, you know, it involves, you know, it's systems investments, you know, there are a number of different things um, uh, and a commitment to continuous improvement and so on. And we, you know, some of these, you know, emerged as, you know, the five different drivers um, around, you know, visionaries that are leveraging sales enablement effectively. But the the hindrances have been, I think, it just, um, you know, generally, it's just, it represents a new way of doing things. And there will be, and an evolving way of doing mm-hmm. things. And there are always going to be, you know, those individuals and those teams that lean into faster ways of improving. And those are going to be the companies that succeed. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the, another stat I've always been stunned by is, you know, 50% of the S&P 500 turns over every 10 years. And I think right. that's, you know, probably accelerating now, but it's like, how is that even possible? Well, it's because there are, you know, a number of companies that are, are, are constantly looking for ways to dramatically improve their operations and they grow really quickly and they start to squeeze out those that aren't committed to that kind of continuous improvement. And to your point earlier, you know, and this was a, a quote I love from, I don't know if you ever follow Scott Galloway's um, writings, but uh, you know, a year ago at the start of pandemic, he said, yeah, it's pandemic's not changing the future, it's just accelerating it. And right. Yeah, we've we've definitely seen that. 
And it's interesting, though, too, to see as, you know, even in businesses seemingly as, as oriented towards disruption as many SaaS companies, is that it's very interesting in your take. I mean, enablement is evolving rapidly. You said it, it's uh, being looked at more strategically by companies. Yet, we sort of had this sort of SaaS sales model as it's sort of been constituted for 20 plus years now. And it's still being sort of used as the playbook. And, you know, my, my feeling is talking to as many people as I talk to for the show and CXOs and so on is that it's kind of kind of creaky at this point. You know, is it our, I'm just interested in what you're seeing in terms of, okay, enablement's changing, we got things change around, but yeah, are we re-looking at our fundamental model? I mean, we do have this issue, you know, we get into, as you talked about, is we take our most junior people and put them at the tip of the spear and uh, say, go have good business conversations, which is a hard expectation for somebody that's just out of school, doesn't have business experience, uh, and, you know, the, <laughs> they churn every 12 to 14 months, so we're sort of perpetuate the problem. I mean, as, as, if we really want to enable people, don't we have to look at the whole, the whole process, not just, you know, the coaching and the training and the content, but, and, you know, how they interact with the buyers, but yeah, everything, how the whole process operates. It, in fact, that that is a really good way to look at it. Look at it, you know, the customer journey as a process. And so, what, you know, what are the different phases of that journey, in which a you know a prospective customer is engaging? So, um, you know, recognizing that a lot of people now do in teams do, you know, the self serve research. It's really mm-hmm. important that the content that's available via a variety of different channels, saying Quinn's own website, analyst reports, industry reports, you know, customer testimonials, et cetera, um, is available to prospects so that they can get the information. Those initial calls into a company or outreach into a company um, need to um, foster an initial conversation that's credible. And, um, And so you get into things like, you know, what is the, what is the conversation? What's the routing? What's the follow up? I mean, mm-hmm. it really becomes, you know, very much a, a, you know, a process. Like how quickly, literally, how quickly does the company engage, and how does the company engage, and does it make it super easy for the prospect to, um, you know, learn more mm-hmm. about uh, a solution? And so, um, the other kind of component, the other component that we we are talking about this that we surfaced earlier is just is that notion of the end to end journey and like the consistent story throughout. It doesn't necessarily mean same set of slides or the same, you know, the same story, but it, the, when a company engages with the prospect there, they can create, they have the opportunity to create a mosaic in which all the conversations in the story align around the customer need and the core value proposition and the company itself looks like one company. And the, if you take the, the, the view of like, okay, what actually is the end-to-end customer experience? And you actually go through it, like actually test it. You know, what was the branding of what a prospective customer saw here you know, at the mm-hmm. different stages? What were the materials that were actually shared? Um, was everything kind of up to date? And that's, that is a very difficult problem to solve. But the companies that do find ways to continuously improve that end-to-end journey that's highly resonant where the teams are aligned are the ones that are going to come across as being the most credible with the prospect. Yeah. And it's, and again, it's not just the, it's not just the one buyer. It's like multiple personas, you know, for the, you know, for more complex deals. And so it's, uh, it's tricky. The other thing too, just thinking about it from like an employee standpoint, like BDRs today, you know, junior, to your point, relatively junior, they've spent their entire you know adult lives, you know, with mm-hmm. their smartphone and you know multiple apps and like anything that they've needed information on is at their fingertips and so their expectation going into the work world is they're going to be able to use their mobile phone to get any mm-hmm. information they need if that's not actually um the case they're likely to turn out very quickly because they're it's they're being asked to operate in a totally different world than they've spent the last few years of their lives operating yeah well, that's one of the interesting 
questions that get asked all the time is because people talk about you know, changing behavior on the parts of the buyers who have similarly been socialized uh, as digital natives and how different, how different they are, which, yes, certainly differences exist. But I think there's a, a point that hasn't changed, and, and which is that you know, at some point, and self-service is great, and we're going to see it take place, uh, as you, to your point earlier, but the higher dollar value transactions. But there's always risk, right? And at some point, the risk <laughs> says, oh, I need to talk to somebody. And, and I think that's, that, that part's not going to change. You know, even, even people who are younger generation of buyers, uh, comfortable doing things virtually and digitally, when it's an important enough decision, people still want to talk to people. Absolutely. And, and so people need to be prepared to have those conversations and have the right conversations. That's absolutely right. And, and back to the McKinsey stat I cited earlier, the 75% prefer to engage digitally. Like part of that is self-service research, but part of it is is via web conferencing, you know, with a with an actual person. But it's mm-hmm. I think from a buyer perspective, the buyer experience is, hey, it's much like I don't I don't need to go through all the hassle of having someone come visit our site. But I, but I do need to hop on a call you know, or hop on a com, you know video conference and mm-hmm. have a conversation with a real person. And so I, I do agree with Andy that that's, you know, particularly on higher value deals, that's always going to be important. Yeah, I mean, you think about sort of the analogy, let's say, because medicine sometimes uses a proxy for AI-driven decision-making. And, and there's been studies done on this already that, uh, you know, people have something of, sort of a critical nature medically that they need to make a decision about. It could be a surgery or whatever. That actually the, you know, these decision support systems exist already where they could do AI driven. They could go through, get all the information and probably make as good a decision, if not a better decision, perhaps with that. But they want to talk to a human. They want to talk to a doctor about it, right? And And we have a lot of that, I think, in sales. I mean, to your point earlier, some of it's going away, but... To me, the, the wild card is always risk. You know, there's always risk in terms of risk to them personally as a stakeholder evolving, this, you know, getting involved in the decision, risk to the company, I mean, multiple facets of risk. And as long as the risk exists, then <laughs> people want to talk to people. Well, you're hitting upon the trust factor. And I think right. trust is, um, it, I think it's influenced by many things, but does this person I'm talking to actually understand my issue? Are they mm-hmm. truly trying to serve up the right solution for me? And would they tell me if they don't have the right solution? Mm-hmm. Um, are they going to be there after we make the purchase decision? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are all those components. Um, are they informed about, you know, our, our, our situation, our company, the category, the space, um, you know, and does this company, does it look like one, you know, it, am I hearing essentially very similar things across right. the board? This is, you know, wild, wildly different stories. So there, there's so many different factors that come into trust, but it, to your point, end of the day, people buy from people. And so generally, unless it's like a, you know, uh, uh, consumer online transaction, but yeah. for the most part, having that personal connection um, in many, many cases is still really important. Well, it's interesting. You read even online for consumer goods. You'll read reviews on Amazon or whatever place you are. It could be a vendor's own site, and you'll say, "Yeah, you know, I bought it. It wasn't the right size. I called the customer service. They were so great. Yeah, you know, I'm a right. I'm a customer for life. Yes, right." Yeah, like, I mean that's part. I mean that that is a really good point. That is part that like that is part of Amazon's value proposition. Where, um, and I think we probably all had that exact same experience where we, we feel safer making purchases because the one that didn't work out got resolved really quickly. Yeah, but in this case though, as a person they interacted with, because you know, purely e-commerce transaction, as I said it could be something like shoes. And actually, it was I brought up because I was buying a pair of shoes online last <laughs> night, and and I saw this review right for somebody that said. Yeah, I mean, they were incredible. It wasn't quite the right size. I called them. Right. They answered right away. They shipped out a new pair the next day. I returned. Everything was so simple. 
customer for life. It's like, yeah, that was the person that made the difference. Yeah, I, I did have a similar experience. I, I, I got the home treadmill that came and it, it, it wasn't what I needed and it, I couldn't go through the standard process. So I, I called and then it was resolved by a person immediately and yeah. it just it made all the difference. Yeah. So, but you didn't buy another product from them or did you? I did. Okay. I, I bought a different version of the treadmill. <laughs> there you go. Different model. And it's, yeah, it's, uh, I should probably be using it more, but it's. Uh, yeah, it's I was going to say, that was your fighting the the COVID-19. Uh, exactly. Yes. The <laughs> other 19. The other 19. Right. <laughs> yeah. We've all, uh, I think we all had that. <laughs> yeah. we, all, we all need to get back to our fighting weight. That's for sure. Um, I'm working on it. I'm not there yet. And partially because <laughs> my wife still insists on baking her incredible sourdough bread, uh, ah. <laughs> which started during the pandemic and has not relented. So Yes. That's one thing. She makes it, I eat it. I can't help myself. So I don't know how you could turn that down. Yeah, no, it's very hard. So all right. Well, Michael, we've run out of time and uh we'll have you back. We'll talk about the report. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, this is really great. It's been it's been fun chatting with you and uh yes, it'd be great to talk about the report. Yeah, we'll do that. All right, Michael. If people want to connect with you, best way to do that, LinkedIn. Yes. Okay, perfect. Great. I'm, I'm not even going to ask that question anymore. I've decided, I always ask for 925 times I've asked guests that question. <laughs> just, yeah. funny. Over the over the years, we've done the podcast. It's evolved. I mean, it originally it was come to my website, then it was my email, people would give their phone numbers, now it's just at yeah, LinkedIn. So yep. LinkedIn works. That's the way it should be. All right, Michael, pleasure to meet you. Thanks, Andy. Okay, friends, that's it for this episode. First of all, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. So grateful for your support of the show. And I want to thank my guest, Michael Longren, for sharing his insights with us today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast, Sales Enablement with Andy Paul, on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And I want to thank you so much for investing your time with me today. Until next time, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Hi, friends. I have something really exciting to share with you. We're launching a new podcast called the RevOps Podcast as part of the Ring DNA podcast family. Today's leading B2B companies are embracing revenue operations as the answer to misaligned people, processes, and data that lead to recurring sales inefficiencies. However, many people still have critical questions about RevOps. What processes and tools do I need? How do I structure my team? How do I measure outcomes across sales, marketing, and customer success? And what are the best practices for doing that? So join Jordan Henderson, Jonathan Stevens, and Brandon Redlinger, and some of the world's leading revenue operations leaders as they tackle the important questions many of you face today when building a RevOps function. From Ring DNA, the company that transforms sales teams into high-performing revenue drivers, comes a podcast guaranteed to go beneath the surface-level conversations and dive deep into the world of RevOps. Your hosts deliver unfiltered, thought-provoking discussions and actionable takeaways on every episode about the ideas, processes, and technology changing the B2B sales landscape. Visit ringdna.com slash RevOps to learn more or subscribe now on your favorite podcast player. What if your sales team could know the moment a buyer arrives on your website and talk with them instantly? With Qualified's conversational sales and marketing platform purpose-built for Salesforce, that's all possible. It's not rocket science, it's common sense. Conversations move deals forward. Live chat, voice calls, and meeting bookers accelerate sales conversations without a single email exchange. Capture prospects in that magic moment when they're most interested in learning about your business. Head on over to Qualified.com to chat with their team and learn more.